So welcome to this video in which I will be um, uh, taking you in a journey towards um, distributed memory parallelism or shade nothing parallelism using uh, message passing interface um, um, library called MPI. So <clears throat> the outline would go uh, as follows. So first of all, we'll, um, I will provide motivation for distributed uh, memory parallelism. Um, and I will um, consider a couple of hardware, typical hardware configurations uh, to show you how massive parallelism can be achieved with uh, distributed <clears throat> structures or shade uh, nothing structures. Um, and then um, I would be making a general introduction on the uh, message passing model um to show you the contrast with the shade memory parallelism and uh, how can we use it for single and multiple um uh, program or instruction multiple data um parallelism um then we'll make a brief history uh, overview on mpi and um its basic routines plus uh, compiling and running our first uh, program so later on, we will see how do we communicate with point-to-point -point communication. And uh, at the end, we will see um, how collaborative communication would work, okay? So let's start with the, with the first part, with the motivation. So, so far, we have learned how to use Pthread, OpenMP, and Java to achieve uh, shared uh, memory parallelism. It means uh, parallelism on the same computer and on the same um, uh, core, but using multiple threads. We could also have used uh, GPU-based acceleration where we could use um, uh, GPU routines uh, to perform massive scalar uh, operations on matrices and vectors. But um, what if the computational problem that you have in hand demands more power, really much more power? So larger than any powerful known single machine hardware configuration. Would you like to have an example? Let's see an example. What if you would like to uh, simulate uh, simulate the, the brain, how the brain functions? So let's simplify the problem to the maximum. If you want to consider 1% of, of uh, the, the whole brain, uh, it approximately uh, approximately contain uh, 2 billion neurons and 10 trillion synapses. Um, to simplify the problem, if you want, if you are able to represent each synapse uh, um, with 24 bytes, then you would need um, 16 gig RAM uh, PC uh, to be able to run your simulation for only 1% of the brain. So how many of these machines uh, you would need to store the full model, okay, the 100%? So clearly, like before answering this question with the exact number, clearly you need more machines because you're reaching the, the, the limit with this uh, configuration. So I agree that on servers, we may go up to 64 gigabyte or, or, um, or maybe one terabyte uh, of RAM, but still we can reach this uh, limit uh, very quickly, okay, uh, with, um, larger uh, problems so if, if you do the calculations uh you'll find yourself in need of 1.4 million uh different machines of this caliber here okay which are quite decent uh server machines uh could be so um how this um can be achieved so let's see uh what google uh, um, has in all its data centers worldwide, all combined. So they have, um, they had 1.8 in, in 2012 and um, according to the most recent report in 2016, they have 2.5 million servers. But this is all that they have worldwide and for all the services, all inclusive for, for Android, uh, backend, um, for uh, Google search, um, 
uh, for Google Image Search, for uh, Gmail, uh, Google Drive, Classroom, for all these services actually all combined, they have this number of machines. So clearly they cannot allocate uh, all of these machines or half of them um, only for you to do your brain simulation. So clearly um, we cannot um, um, make uh, uh, such an assumption and, and, and clearly we need models where we can achieve uh, 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 such huge computations. So uh, to this end, you will see that there are battles among manufacturers um, of hardware uh, to create data centers where high performance computing architecture, uh, architectures are built and are made available for researchers to do their um, um, massive calculation simulations. Um, just to uh, give you an idea about um, why would we use a different model other than uh, shared, shared memory parallelism. Um, so I skipped the introduction until now, I will get back to it later on. Um, and this slide is a recall from that introduction. So. Um, if you want to uh, speed up the computations, if you want to achieve the same computation, but faster, then you may use parallelism. Um, sometimes you may use parallelism to um, uh, compute a larger problem with, with, um, um, with your hardware. And sometimes you want actually uh, to uh, compute faster by adding uh, more resources. Okay, so instead of increasing the capability of your resources by um, um, scaling up, by increasing the size of the memory, the number of cores on, on your processors, etc. Well, um, on one single machine, well, you can scale out actually uh, by adding uh, and agglomerating, uh, combining um, 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 multiple machines, several multiple machines. Um, uh, in a network, um, uh, in a networked manner, so that the union of them would achieve uh, faster computations and larger computations. Um, so to see the contrast between these uh, multiple models, so uh, the the basic models where we achieve um, uh, faster computations. Um, with a single instruction uh, on multiple pieces of data, uh, what we call SIMD, we can use what we call vectorization. And it's typical on uh, GPUs, but it's also applicable on certain uh, CPUs. So instead of, for example, summing up the uh, two vectors, uh, one element by one, we can sum them up by chunks of, let's say, 64, uh, elements or 256 elements, etc. So clearly, if we can achieve these summations in parallel, if we can sum up 256 different elements in parallel, then clearly we can divide by this number. Okay, um, we can divide the total number of uh, additions by uh, 64 or 256, and we can achieve a faster computation. But, um, and, and, and clearly this does not require a lot of effort in, in programming because you, you have just to, uh, to declare that you have um, a certain, uh, with a certain directive that you would like to use this uh, feature. Um, but what if uh, actually this, does, is, uh, this is not sufficient for your, um, um, to reduce the, the, the total computation that you have in hand, but if um, uh, the, the, uh, data that you have in hand does not even hold on one single RAM. Okay, so as we said in the uh, brain simulation problem, so um, so even multithreading wouldn't be sufficient in this case. Okay, um, because multithreading can be combined with uh, vectorization, where you split your total work over multiple threads, as we did in with OpenMP or with um, uh, pthread in Java multi-threading um, and where each thread benefits from the uh, vectorization capability to further reduce its, its work. But once you reach, as I said, your limitation in terms of hosting the whole data that you're working on on a single computer or in a single uh, um, uh, bunch of uh, RAM uh, slots, then clearly you need to use 
the uh, union of the capabilities of multiple machines okay by networking them and and putting them together into into uh, work as a single um, uh, unit in this case you need what we call classic computing or distributed memory or shared nothing computing parallel computing okay and to this end um, we will use the mpi library where um, the processes in order to share data between them they cannot make simple accesses to shared variables um, um, uh, or shared uh, vectors and matrices well clearly they need to send and receive data between them um, uh, so that they can uh, collaborate on the same um, uh, pieces of uh, information so with the shared memory system typically we have a single machine and uh, where the processes or the threads they have come in under space for uh, tasks and the hardware scaling is limited okay uh, we will talk about this uh, later on um, it's the introduction that we skipped until now where we can evoke the concept of um, power wall and memory wall the walls that we uh, are hitting currently because we cannot um, um, increase the number of transistors on cpus and we cannot we cannot make the memory uh, slots faster or larger in terms of uh, space. So um, again, this is why we need shared nothing or distributed memory systems, uh, where the tasks are assigned on multiple machines. Each one has its own local, uh, separate, private memory space. Um, so uh, this is why we need a global task uh, coordination by explicit messaging uh, interchange. Um, and um, in this case, you see that it's quite easy to scale out by adding uh, more machines uh, that they can communicate together through the network. Um, the parallel had hardware that you may um, uh, use, um, it's uh, typically clusters or supercomputers. Um, so clusters, we mean by clusters, a um, group of nodes of com computing machines that are linked together. Um, um, even if it's done with basic settings um, and on cheap computers. Um, and we talk about supercomputers or uh, um, um, data centers where we have already very heavy uh, um, hardware specification on every single node or machine and the uh, hardware settings, uh, the, the agglomeration of machines uh, is made up by a very uh, finely tuned um, uh, network settings and installation, uh, professional installation. Okay, so the, 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 the aim is to run heavily uh, parallel software that is particularly designed to benefit from such uh, um, uh, infrastructures. Uh, it's completely different from distributed systems such as web applications or cloud applications um, and, um, where actually we have a single parallel application um, but that requires um, a client and server um, um, uh, a model implementation so um, it's, it's not the same as having one single um, program, having a, um, a large uh, or a huge uh, scientific calculations being performed really in parallel on all the nodes of a certain a cluster or supercomputer. So um, in the cluster uh, model, uh, we have um, a collection of standalone machines connected by a local network. Uh, it's a cost-effective uh, cost effective technique for a large-scale parallel computer. Uh, the users are the builders, and they have control over the system. The synchronization in this case uh, is much slower than in shared memory, and uh, the task granularity becomes an issue because um, mapping the various tasks to the various machines that you have in hand uh, becomes a bit tricky. Um, um, if you fixed somehow the uh, physically the uh, connections between your machines, um, so so you need to take it off the uh, carefully of the mapping of the tasks to the various machines. You you, you cannot, for example, have um, a machine here and, and and a machine that is physically distant from it there, um, uh, so that they have to share a piece of data because the communication is 
infinitely uh, uh, slower between this machine and that machine in comparison with uh, two consecutive or uh, adjacent machines in, in these settings. Um, so um, with supercomputers, uh, you see that the, the um, um, uh, hardware settings uh, and, and installation is uh, much more professional. So we have massively parallel processing systems. Um, we have a, a cluster, but with a lot of processes on it. Um, and even with optimized storage uh, settings, it's not an agglomeration of regular personal computers uh, like classes. So uh, still it's a kind of a standard hardware uh, with a processor RAM and, and storage, but a very specialized uh, setup. Uh, it allows for high performance um, uh, computing through high performance interconnection network with optical fiber and, and, and particular networking settings that we shall see in a couple of slides. And um, for massive uh, data parallel applications, uh, um, and mostly simulations of, of, of weapons, climate, earthquakes, and so on, uh, these supercomputers are the best match, okay? Um, usually such applications cannot run on, on um, let's say, amateur uh, uh, clusters. Um, just to give you an idea, um, you may consider the Blue Gene um, uh, supercomputer built by uh, ABM. It has 1.5 million cores. Okay, so uh, you can imagine. Um, it has 1.5 um, uh, uh, petabyte uh, memory and it can achieve uh, 17 teraflops uh, per second. Okay, so uh, this is the version that dates back to 2013. If you check the version of November 2018 of the same series, uh, you will see 143 petaflops instead of 17 teraflops. And it, um, the um, the the uh, um, total number of cores is reaches almost 2.4 million uh, cores instead of 1.5. So it, it almost doubled. Uh, over five years. Um, if you want to check the monstrous machines or supercomputers that we have worldwide, you can check this very nice website. Uh, a, a, um, a quick statistics from 2018 shows you that um, uh, nowadays um, the, the HPC power, the high performance computing power uh, that is designed by particular companies uh, or particular countries it really defines their supremacy. So they use it as an indicator of their um, uh, technological uh, supremacy and even political supremacy somehow, okay? Uh, so clearly the, 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 the countries who have um, the, the largest computing uh, powers, uh, they are the most able to crack passwords, uh, to invade the privacy, to, uh, to hack, um, uh, into um, um, crypto cryptographic uh, routines, etc. Okay, and uh, the vendors who are uh, the most capable of providing uh, the, the the largest um, and most uh, efficient high performance computing architectures. So they are the, the they prove uh, that they are the most knowledgeable in terms of um, hardware manufacturing and optimization. So this give them this image notoriety uh, in the market. Um, just to give you an idea why uh, the um, particularly um, optimized supercomputers dif completely differ from the uh, um, amateur clusters, um, or let's say, let's call them also, they, they could be done by professional um, uh, experts, but they, they are still uh, non-optimized, let's call them. Um, so uh, the, the optimized supercomputing um, architecture would, would to um, would be composed um, uh, gradually out of the follows. You will take each chip you have that is already uh, dual core or octa core, and you will uh, put it on a certain uh, chip module. Um, you will uh, plug uh, one chip module with its uh, block of RAM um, in a um, compute card. And you will put every X compute cards, maybe 32 or 64 or more, 
on a single uh, node card, okay? Um, and already you have a network between them. So you'll have a five dimensional torus that interconnect all these uh, compute cards uh, to, to guarantee uh, a kind of um, uniform communication between all of these uh, chips, even if they were, um, uh, as if they were um, uh, connected through the same uh, motherboard or um, this on, on, as if they were functioning on the same chip. Uh, you will take one node card and you will uh, insert it in um, a, uh, an input output a drawer and you will uh, put um, every 16 node cards in uh, a middle plane um, um, and uh, in the blue gene actually particularly every two mid planes go on a certain rack and in the in the uh, whole um, uh, to, to, to compose the final blue gene supercomputer uh, uh, they will use uh, a system of 96 racks of course they can increase this number by manufacturing furthermore nodes furthermore uh, um, uh, racks etc okay so they can they can scale out uh, um, uh, eventually but you notice the kind of hardware that, that is used in these infrastructures. It's completely different uh, uh, from uh, traditional um, um, and, and users' uh, computers, clearly. Uh, as for the network, you need a very optimized network settings. Uh, so um, in first attempts, they um, opted for bus systems, for uh, star-connected uh, networks or meshes. Um, um, crossbar switches or factories, um, rings and linear arrays, but clearly uh, the uh, most used um, um, uh, network interconnection model nowadays is the N-way D-dimensional uh, uh, mesh or torus. Um, so here you have a four-way dimensional uh, mesh. Here you have a four-way 2D torus because um, besides uh, interconnecting all the nodes together side by side the first and the last node on each uh, column are interconnected <clears throat> uh, in this way you see this interconnection between the first and the last node um, um, on each column and also on each row so you have a 2d torus um, uh, you, you can also have um, a d-dimensional uh, torus. Um, so, for example, the blue gene has a 5D torus um, um, in, 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 on, on each uh, uh, compute card, okay? So, uh, yeah, so here you, you, can, you can see the 5D torus uh, interconnect in blue gene supercomputers. We have uh, 2 gig per second on all the 10 links uh, that are used um, uh, to, to interconnect the, um, the computing uh, units. Um, and you have, um, they can reach actually 18 and a second latency uh, to the direct neighbors and uh, a reasonable latency on, on uh, the um, um, farthest one. Okay, so, so it's a very optimized network, interconnected network uh, units of computing units um, uh, so that the latency over the network uh, becomes uh, minimal. So uh, once you understood this, um, now we have to check how we can program um, um, parallel um, or create parallel programs that can benefit from such structures. Well, actually, whether it's a simple cluster or a large one or a supercomputer, it's the same model. So um, in contrast to the shared memory uh, programming, where you either share data in, in the heap that is uh, allocated in the process address space um, and that is shared between the threads, or in the shared memory uh, uh, space, uh, that is uh, shared between multiple processes. So whether you are doing uh, multi-processing or multiple threading, multi-threading, um, you do not have this shared memory uh, setting. So this is why we call it sometimes instead of distributed memory programming, shared nothing programming. So you have multiple independent control streams or processes. All the data is private to each process. So each process works with its own uh, data 
uh, zone, okay? So each computer has, or computing unit has its own RAM or um, memory. So the coordination is required to enforce consistency by communicating data and information. And this can be done uh, through the network. So this is why we talked about the network settings and how optimized uh, it should be in order to guarantee a fast um, um, communication between the computing nodes and um, a minimal latency uh, um, to not make an overhead on the uh, uh, computations, okay? Because uh, if, if we want to cut our problem into several different chunks, we don't want uh, um, to get an overhead when, when it comes to computing, uh, to, to actually distributing the data over multiple uh, processing units and, and uh, collecting the data at the end, okay? If it's gonna take days to spread the data over all the uh, computing uh, units in, in, um, in the infrastructure and then multiple days to collect the data, so, but a couple of hours to do the computations, <laughs> then maybe you would uh, be, um, 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 actually more interested in, 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 in running uh, sequentially the code on one single processing unit and to avoid the days overhead, okay? Um, so um, the communication uh, that is necessary, it can be uh, done in a direct way from one node to another specific node, or it can be co uh, done collectively. For example, this node uh, can um, uh, ask the uh, infrastructure to broadcast a certain piece of data to all the other nodes uh, uh, at once, okay? So we have both end-to-end uh, -end and collaborative um, uh, communication um, routines. So the most common communication method is called the message passing, and we have a very famous specification for this called the MPI or the message passing interface. Um, and with a, uh, a decent implementation that has been uh, multiple decent implementations such as Open MPI uh, and MPI CH um, that have been tested and widely used in the literature. So how um, the, the uh, message passing model would work. So usually we would use a certain application to submit uh, jobs um, uh, to uh, a certain cluster management software. These jobs are actually parallel programs, okay? So these are parallel programs. Um, they they um, are sent to the cluster management software that will actually uh, send multiple instances to multiple computing um, uh, units or execution hosts, um, the code will start running in parallel. Certain communications between some of the nodes will take place. And then finally, one of them designated as the master will return the final result to the, um, uh, to the, uh, to the end user. Okay, so the user submit uh, the message passing program and data as a job. The cluster management system creates program instances. They calculate, um, they, they perform the calculations and sometimes they need to communicate together in order to uh, exchange a partial uh, results. And one of them will uh, collect the final result um, and send it to the end user. Um, in this case, they would be uh, rather doing a single program, multiple data uh, approach or a single instruction, multiple data uh, approach, SIMD. Uh, so uh, you write one program and, and uh, you have large, uh, typically large amount of data that is cut into chunks. Um, and uh, the um, single program with the multiple pieces of data are sent to multiple instances. So here instance number zero is maybe working on the chunk of data uh, number one, D1. Um, uh, instance number one is working on D2 that we, ha we have here, etc. Okay, so each instance is working on chunk of the data, uh, separate chunk of the data. Um, um, but you can also use actually uh, the message passing uh, a model to uh, perform multiple program, multiple data, or uh, multiple instruction, multiple data, MIMD. Um, so um, usually this can be implemented as a single program, multiple data, uh, parallel program, which depending on some criterion, executes the relevant constituent, uh, uh, constituent code. So um, 
For example, you can have your processes switching um, based on their IDs. And if um, it is the ID of the process number zero, then they would run the program number one, uh, else they would run the program number two, et cetera, et cetera. So um, using uh, such constructs, you can also uh, target what we call the multiple instruction, multiple data paradigm. Um, an example, a process number one may have a, a large array of integers to be uh, sorted. Um, what can be done is to uh, send half of this array to another process so that each process would perform a, um, um, a merge sort locally to sort all these uh, values and in, in, uh, to put them in order and uh, so that the other process would uh, do the same thing um, but really in parallel and then once these results are um, uh, done we can actually use um, um, the merge operation which is to the order of n in order to merge the results from both processes in in this process number one and then uh, um, the the um, this process which is in this case can be called the master process can send the final result to the end user um, great but how can we achieve this in practice uh, well we can use as i told you the message passing interface what is the message passing interface well it's a, um, a specification of message passing um, and it has multiple implementations, such as the um, uh, Open MPI or the MPI CH. Okay, you will see me using the MPI CH, and I will give you the help of how to install the MPI CH under under Linux. But you can also learn about the uh, uh, other libraries and install them and use them on your own. Um, it's uh, portable and efficient. It has been in use since um, almost twenty eight years uh, ago. Um, it supports distributed uh, memory computing on a cluster of nodes and uh, multi-processing in shared memory on single node. So this is what's really nice with MPI. In case you don't have multiple nodes, in case you only have one single node, one computer, it falls back to multi-processing on shared memory. Okay, And then the code that you wrote uh, asking to run your code on multiple hosts will actually run kind of sequentially using the multi-processing capability of your machine okay uh, so as much as you have cores you will have multi-processes running in parallel so uh, the um, i will leave you the host history uh, um, uh, slide to read on your own um, uh, so uh, it shows you the the, the key um, uh, milestones of um, um, uh, how mpi um, uh, have been um, actually um, um, considered as the conversion of multiple systems that existed uh, earlier. Um, and uh, finally, once this conversion uh, has been uh, standardized, um, the uh, um, famous libraries such as MPI CH and Open MPI uh, took place. And, and, and these are the de facto standards that are used nowadays. Um, um, just in case we are uh, um, uh, uh, realizing certain um, the need for certain uh, APIs or novelties, usually in the consortium taking care of the development of MPI, they will they will agree on this, these updates and they will create the next version of um, uh, MPI by adding uh, some new routines each time. It's it's really needed. Okay. Um, so what's the essence of MPI? It, it, um, it's a library that assumes that at runtime you have a fixed number, sorry, uh, a fixed number of uh, process instances. Uh, they are defined on setup. Once this is done, you can group your uh, processes into multiple communication groups and they can achieve point to point. It means from one particular machine or process to one particular machine or process Communication, these communications can be blocking or non-blocking and can be synchronous or asynchronous. We will learn more about these uh, in the next session. Uh, you can also perform collective communications from one machine to all the others, from uh, all the machines to one particular one, uh, a machine, 
uh, or from uh, any machine uh, to uh, from all the machines to all the other machines, just to synchronize their uh, uh, data and their intermediate results. Um, uh, the focus in MPI is on uh, communication and memory usage. So when, when you learn about these collective communication and uh, some advanced features of MPI, you see how fine-tuned it is. Um, um, and um, in the API, the application programming interface of, of MPI, um, you have a fixed, um, you have a certain number of functions, uh, as we saw a couple of slides earlier, and each function has a fixed number of arguments. Um, and the, the semantics of the functions is um, fixed, actually, uh, so that no matter what the implementation, um, even if you have different implementations taking different details of the operating system into consideration and low level network routines, uh, they, they are still acceptable implementations as long as they uh, are keeping on the same uh, uh, agreed on semantics. Um, um, okay, so you can, you can check how, for example, MPI, CH and Open MPI um, are implementing the uh, semantics of, of MPI in a slightly different way, yet uh, while preserving the semantics of the uh, standard or the, 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 the functions of the standard. Um, and you should know that MPI is not a particular language. It's just um, a specification. It's not a compiler specification. It's a specification uh, of a library or um, uh, that you can import in your C program. And um, um, you, you need a particular implementation or product uh, uh, for your specification to be effective and to be executed on top of the uh, C um, um, runtime environment. Okay, so let's see our first example um, um, in a couple of slides. Um, you should know that MPI has applications in, in multiple domains in science and engineering. So it's, it's, it's used in large scale uh, parallel applications in science and engineering. I will leave you uh, the details uh, to be read on your own, but just name it, whether it's in physics um, and in, in um, uh, genetics, in biology, um, geology, uh, mechanical engineering, electrical engineering, or computer science. So you will find um, 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 scientific applications that require um, uh, heavy uh, simulations and heavy calculations. And in this case, you will find that um, MPI and shared nothing parallelism uh, with MPI uh, are the uh, only way uh, to uh, perform these heavy calculations. So let's get into the practical part, okay? Um, so maybe I will do it in a separate video so that uh, you can refer to that video um, uh, independently of this um, uh, introduction.